So while we're sort of waiting on everyone to join in, uh, I just want to take again a moment to thank you all. And, and I hope that you've had a chance to download and have a look at the report. Um, in the last, what are we, 24 hours, we have had uh, over 800 uh, downloads. Now, 200 of those were mistakes, and that was on us. And I'll touch on that in, in a little bit. Um, so uh, for those of you who got my, uh, my email with the correction, uh, I do apologize. Um, over the next hour, we're going to be sharing some of the insights from the report, some of our experiences, and some of, sort of what we are uh, seeing uh, both in the data as well as just out there in the world today. Um, we want to make this short and sweet, fairly uh, direct. There, I have invited um, some amazing uh, speakers or contributors uh, who have uh, been with us to help produce this report. And I've asked each of us, and myself included, to limit our conversations uh, and our sort of talks to about five minutes. Um, if all goes to plan, and we all know that never really happens, but we'll try. If all goes to plan, we will finish the sort of the formal presentations in a little over half an hour. Um, at that point, we will open up fully for Q&A, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, so we want to take this opportunity to, to answer any of the questions that you have regarding any of the, any of the findings in the report, anything that we have uh, seen, anything even behind that, that may not have been published. Um, but of course, any, anything that you want to get off your chest, preferably related to business agility, to be honest. Um, we'll start off, uh, I'd like to introduce our amazing panelists. So Steve Denning, uh, who really needs no introduction, but I will very quickly introduce him, um, will be kicking us off, uh, uh, talking, sh sharing a little bit about his experiences and sort of what he is seeing. Um, uh, Steve, for those of you who have read the report, uh, kindly um, produced the preface and helped sort of shape some of the, um, the I'm sort of looking for uh, messaging around business agility. Um, after Steve, uh, we are delighted to have Sally Alata join us. Uh, Sally is the CEO and founder of Agility Health, which uh, for those of you who took the survey, um, which of course is where the data is coming from. Um, it is her tool that is being used in that. And uh, beyond that, Sally herself is one of those people I have the, an enormous amount of uh, respect for in terms of her knowledge and experience and just her heart. And, and uh, I think Sally and I gave a, a talk a little while ago on leading with love. So it's something that I think uh, is important in this day and age. Sally will then hand off to Martin. Uh, uh, Martin is from an organization here in Australia, uh, Melbourne, same city as I am, where it is quite dark. Um, and uh, uh, he's from uh, Teamform. Teamform, uh, as the organization provided the um, uh, statistical quantitative and some qualitative analysis. So he'll be talking, uh, going deep into, uh, how, uh, he'll be going deep into what the data says and why it's really exciting. Um, and uh, if you're like me, data can be quite exciting. Uh, from Martin, we hand over to Christoph. Christoph is from Solutions IQ Accenture in Germany, right? No, Netherlands, Netherlands. Yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Um, from the Netherlands, um, uh, uh, Christoph uh, provided a lot of the analysis, the, the, the qualitative analysis for the successes and challenges, as well as helped to contribute and, and write a lot of the recommendations uh, against some of those challenges. And then very quickly, I will wrap up with some of the key findings and sort of what we're seeing and what is happening out there in the world. Um, so 
uh, that's pretty much it. At that point, we should be about half past and we'll open for Q&A. So please start adding your questions into the Q&A now um, so that we don't have that awkward silence at the um, end of the talk when we're waiting for the first question to emerge. On that, um, I have the delight and honor to hand over to Steve uh, to sort of uh, not only give the preface to the report, but the preface to this launch event as well. Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Evan. And uh, really delighted to be here with you today. Um, to state the obvious, it's been a, a year of shattering change. And uh, the, uh, uh, what is striking perhaps is that the firms practicing business agility have prospered uh, during this year. Uh, I mean, the very uh, most advanced organizations like the big uh, famous organizations, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and whatnot, um, they have become the most valuable firms on the planet with unprecedented wealth generated. Um, and uh, other firms at uh, more modest levels, uh, all of my contacts with them have indicated that um, once they are in a mode of business agility uh, focused on customers working in small teams and short cycles. The shift to working virtually was uh, hardly noticeable, no big deal at all. And uh, the, uh, if you read the report, it uh, kind of indicates this. The report is not very much different from last year. It's as though you couldn't deduce from the data in the report that there had been some shattering economic event in the, in the world. And it's a bit like that Sherlock Holmes uh, story, uh, the dog didn't bark. <laughs> what was the most significant event last night? The dog didn't bark. It was the fact the report didn't show any massive change, even though the world was going through these wrenching, wrenching changes. And by comparison, the firms still being managed in what I'm beginning to call 20th century management um, have struggled mightily. And uh, for, uh, for them, the shift to working virtually was often a wrenching change. Um, and for those in, in micromanagement, it was a increased stress for those being micromanaged and increased stress for the micromanagers who could no longer uh, practice their micromanagement on, on their victims. And so it was a very bad scene. And that group is anxious to get back uh, to at least the less bad situation where they were in the same place and at least containing the struggles of, uh, of micromanagement. And by and large, uh, sadly, and I think I, all my indications are that um, a majority of organizations are still practicing 20th century management. By and large, that's the, the situation in the world. And uh, so one of the agonizing questions we have, why is there such a gap? Uh, we know that this business agility is a better way to run an organization's benefit with the world of the 21st century. So how come most big corporations are still being run in a 20th century fashion? Why is it still being taught in business schools? Why is it being assumed in most management articles in Harvard Business Review, even though there's an occasional uh, article saying, hey, what about agile? What about business ability? Uh, or by and large, uh, majority of firms are still living in the 20th century. And uh, so when we look at this report, it's really, a, uh, I think, fair to say, those who uh, are agile insiders, those who wear a sort of agile badge, um, those who consider themselves part of this movement, and uh, it's an accurate report of, um, of that world. Uh, but in future, I sense we need to be looking more widely uh, to those who uh, don't consider themselves part of the uh, agile community, those that operate under different labels, um, and particularly <laughs> these firms operating in the 20th century, uh, how can they be brought into the 21st century? Uh, what are the success stories that could help us uh, lead to that? And particularly pointing to cases uh, where uh, transform transformations have been successful. Um, that this is not a hopeless case. When you look at all, all of the big uh, success stories like Microsoft or SRI, uh, it begins with one person. One person saying, this is unacceptable. We need to move into a different world. And so we need to encourage 
everyone to say, if you're not happy in your current environment, let's be the person, become the person who leads the charge into the future. And with that, I'll pass the word to Sally, who can show us how to get there. Thank you so much, Steve. I don't know that I'm going to give him the, the full solution, the checklist, because there is no um, direct way on how to get there. What I wanted to share with you guys is two things. One of them is don't unlearn what you just learned during COVID. Um, as uh, Steve just really walked us through, I think we just all got a boot camp in business agility, whether your company intentionally was, a business, was on a journey uh, towards business agility and transforming, or whether you didn't even consider this, you had to learn in the past several months, how do you create outcomes, right? Um, and one of the companies that I was working with recently is a very large financial bank that uh, the story that they shared with me, which I think is worth sharing because it's meaningful, is they had to process in one week, 1.1 million PPP, if you guys remember the payment protection, uh, the, the payment protection plan that came out, um, so they can save small businesses. And they had only processed about 50 of those the year before. So they had within one week or 10 days, they created that outcome, very clear outcome. And they empowered the teams and they said, How, help us. <laughs> we have to be able to do this. We have to be able to process uh, the payment protection uh, plan uh, transactions so that we can save X, you know, million small businesses. Here are some of the boundaries. Here's some of the acceptance criteria please be creative. We are going to reduce the processes, the overhead, the red tape, and we're gonna empower you to figure out the how. Um, these kind of stories are everywhere now. Organizations that are not traditionally um, agile or that really were potentially laggards even in, in adoption of agile that had to go through this boot camp recently. And so what I want you to think about as you read this report, um, so many of these practices that we just had to apply recently Let's make them stick. This concept of bringing teams from business or technology and aligning them around an outcome, right? And getting work done and achieving business value for our customers. How can we make that stick um, after COVID instead of forgetting about that? One of um, another customer shared, and she said, now that sort of the dust has settled from a lot of that COVID, we're going back to normal. And I said, what does that mean going back to normal? And she said, we now have 40 competing priorities that are all output based and we have no clear outcomes anymore. And I said, okay, interesting. So that would be considered an unlearning of what you had just learned. So, so that's just my first message is really pause as an organization to take some of what you had just learned um, around organizational structure, bringing business and technology teams to work together, being very outcome driven with key results, um, completely focusing on serving the customer and delivering value quickly. Uh, and I think that that would, would go a long way in this business agility journey, um, because even executives that honestly never really even thought about this had to practice it. And even companies and even government agencies that were not willing to allow employees to work online had to shift to digital very quickly. Um, the second message that I have is really around measurement. How can we think about using measurement as a way of accelerating this journey, right? This journey towards business agility. And, and there's a lot of different definitions for uh, business agility, but one that I like because it's a combination of all of them is really, um, it's the ability to respond to change, learn and pivot, deliver at speed and thrive in a competitive market. So if that's really what you want to do, and we all had to go through a lot of that recently, how can I use measurement and continuous improvement as a way of accelerating it? When I say measurement, what I find a lot of companies doing is focusing on performance metrics. So output metrics, um, how much did we get done? How fast was it? What was the quality? How many releases did I release? And oh my gosh, velocity, right? Um, don't, <laughs> don't have me focus on that as the topic, but it's, it's very focused on how much are we getting done? Output, throughput, those are good. Those are really good numbers to have and I'm not saying anything against them. But what I want you to think about is to mature as an organization and accelerate, think about three types of metrics. Think about measuring maturity, which is the practices and the behaviors and the mindsets. Have we actually shifted that? Because maturity leads to performance. It's a leading indicator of performance, which is the quantitative metrics. And performance is a leading indicator for outcomes. And actually outcomes, 
business outcomes really is the only metric that truly matters. Yes, so think about those three metrics together um, and, and leverage measurement and growth. Measurement and growth, make it something that your organization does continuously. Make it just part of the DNA of your organization. And I really promise you, and I've seen so many companies start to do this, that once you learn how to measure and grow, measure and grow in a very systematic way, um, that will be your competitive advantage. You will become a learning organization and you will outlearn and out deliver your competition. Um, because measurement is all we do, I just wanna give you a final message that's really important. If you ever use measurement and the metrics to punish or reward your teams or the leaders, you'll never see the truth again. All data can be gained coming from uh, a system, coming from people. If people know that the purpose of this data is to punish or reward them, they will game the system. So as my friend Troy McGinnis says, don't monkey with the data. Don't monkey with the data means use the data to help growth, to accelerate growth. Don't use it to reward or punish management or leaders or the teams because then they won't be truthful about it. Um, so thank you so much for being part of this journey of business agility. You are now going to dig deeper with Martin um, here into the quantitative metrics. Uh, back to you, Martin. Fantastic, thanks Sally. Um, yeah, so on the data, this is the third year that we've collaborated with the Business Agility Institute to perform the statistical analysis behind the report. Um, this year, we also worked with the team at the Neurotech Institute to, to further increase the analytical rigor of what you're going to hear. So um, the report's a research piece, right? So it's meant to inform our community. Uh, so we invite verification. The details of the methods and the results that we got to behind it are available in a download link that's in the report itself. Um, first, we're pleased to confirm that the survey itself continues to have a high degree of internal consistency. This is really good. Uh, it means that the questions inside it are closely report related to the topic at hand, being business agility. So, uh, on to major analytical callouts for 2020. The three key indicators of relentless improvement, funding models, and value streams continue to be significant predictors of business agility. That's to say that organizations that got high overall business agility scores got high ratings with those three indicators. This is a huge result for us. Um, this research is a social science. It's a field where reproducibility of results is really hard to accomplish, that we have reproducible results across the 2018, 2019, and 2020 surveys pretty much achieves the gold science, uh, standard for social sciences research. So then this year, it gave us a, new, a unique opportunity, one that I hope is really never repeated in our lifetimes, um, to investigate the impact of a major global event, COVID-19, on business agility. Now, we've spoken about this a bit, but um, this part of the work is based on comparing the survey results collected before and after the global lockdown date, which is clustered around the 23rd of March. We were fortunate to have similar numbers of responses in the before and after cohorts. So we expected COVID-19 to be really detrimental to business agility. However, for most geographic regions, they reported an average maturity increase of about 15% post-COVID. Those increases were found to be significant across nine of the domains of business agility, the top two call-outs being the customer maturity or customer focus, and the supporting function maturity, so examples of supporting functions being human resources and the finance departments. This aligns with our first-hand observations that the organizations we work with quickly got over this razor-sharp this razor focus or Sally's you know, boot camp uh, to continue to, 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 to sell and service their customers. So massive shifts of what employees and how employees were having to work with customers with stores shut, different call centers being impacted and whatnot. Um, this rapid response pivot was often facilitated by those human resources and finance people that said, what do you need to get your work done? So, the impact of COVID-19 gives us an early evidence that improving business agility across the entire organization plays a significant role in the effectiveness to respond to big change. So next, we sought to test some hypotheses that were first reported in 2019. We looked at the impact of organizational size and then the time on journey on business agility. When it comes to organizational size, and this year we had almost 50% of respondents coming from organizations with a thousand or more employees, um, it might seem obvious that smaller organizations were more nimble than larger ones. And that's essentially confirmed in the data and qualified with like this small organization benefit plateau around 200 people, which is near Dunbar's number. The largest companies then had an almost 20% lower average maturity than the smaller ones. This gives us a view of the efficiencies that larger organizations need to drive in order to reap the benefits of their size. 
The second hypothesis, looking at the time on journey, that is how long you need to be on an agile journey before significant benefits are seen. The data take, tells us that it takes at least three years. With the benefits occurring over time, with the highest of, uh, average maturity coming in organizations that have been on the journey for eight or more years. That sort of lines up with the Microsoft's learnings and, and such. But this year's pandemic shows us a further effect. The organizations that were also on the journey for eight or more years were also the ones that rated better in adaptation to COVID-19. So in other words, don't lose heart. It takes a while to change how organizations operate, but the benefits of business agility are felt on the medium term and grow with time. So to finish, we performed a qualitative analysis over the short form questions relating to the challenges and benefits along the journey. Christoph will soon speak to what was learned there. Um, in closing, the data from 2020 further reinforces the previous editions of the report. This year brought the unique lens of a global pandemic to test how organizations, their teams, and people responded to disruption. The takeaway advice is straightforward. Get started on your business agility journey, bring along the whole organization on this journey, and pay particular attention to the practices that facilitate the key indicators of relentless improvement, funding models, and value streams. The benefits are real, and just like any good investment, they compound with time. Um, before I finish, you might ask, so what can I do to help with this research? It's fair to say that disruption will continue over the coming year. Um, your participation in the 2021 survey, which is now open, will uh, provide us with really rich insights for the years to come. Spread the word to your colleagues, send that link around. Over to you, Christoph. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Martin. <clears throat> Let me just uh, share my screen uh, briefly to support essentially what uh, what Martin just shared with a little bit more uh, with, let's say, visual background. I hope you guys can see my screen. You can hear me. Um, Right, so while, uh, while Martin and his team very much performed the, the statistical analysis looking at the data, right, we looked into some of the quotes and more, more qualitative data that, um, that some, of, um, uh, some of our participants shared, right? What we can see is that, that essentially from a, from a benefit perspective, uh, we have three main groups of, uh, of benefits that our uh, participants are reporting, being organizational benefits, commercial benefits, and workforce related benefits. Right. What is uh, remarkable, if compared to last year's report, is um, that um, that while uh, last year commercial benefits, in fact, in fact scored first, uh, this year we can see the organizational benefits popping up uh, uh, um, higher, which uh, uh, you know, especially looking at collaboration, internal collaboration, communication, better ways of working, right? Which could be uh, an impact uh, uh, caused by COVID, which we'll go go back to in a in a, in a second, right? Um, Right, so uh, our commercial benefits being speed to market, uh, uh, customer uh, satisfaction, as well as workforce related benefits, motivation, employee satisfaction, and some of the, uh, let's say, benefits that have been associated with uh, business agility in the past. Um, when we look into some of these challenges that organizations find on a, on a, on a path towards business agility, they remain very f fairly similar to those reported last year, right? So it's, it's mostly leadership related challenges, like the leadership style employed the sponsorship uh, the actual so not only sort of supporting it vocally but also in terms of, of budget and funding uh, uh, improvement initiatives uh, but also from a from a, a, a visionary leadership sort of perspective then we have structural challenges right the silos the sort of functional uh, uh, orientation of our organizations rather being uh, 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 organized around specific products and services right sort of the end-to-end -end responsibility of value streams um, alignment funding and the cultural uh, challenges being mindset and culture, which in fact are quite related also to the leadership challenges, right? Because as we know, uh, the leadership styles that we employed are very much uh, are, are copied by within the organization and they create a specific atmosphere, a specific mindset, right? Which is very, very important, right? That actually means, and, 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 and that's something that is, that is persistent, right? Uh, and then that's also something that com came back in a, in a comment of, 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 of Steve uh, just a little bit earlier, right? Because why is this the fact, right? That we still have organizations that are functionally, functionally organized, right? In functional silos, rather than being organized as, around specific, you know, uh, client propositions. And why is this that we still employ leadership styles that are uh, that are originating in the industrial age, 
where we have uh, a workforce that was prominently uh, uh, based on, on, on you know, low-skilled workers. And now we find ourselves back in a knowledge society where we need to employ entirely different leadership styles in order to create communities, in order to motivate our employees um, and, and, and have them for a good cause. Uh, we have a, a workforce that is, that is uh, highly skilled, that is highly educated, that is very, very expensive, which we cannot treat in the same way as we uh, treated the, 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 the uh, always replaceable industrial workers in the past, right? Uh, and, and why is it that we, that we try to measure and, and control these type of, uh, uh, th this workforce in the same way as we, uh, uh, you know, controlled uh, um, the people in our, in our manufacturing, in, in the car factories, counting how many screws they put in a car, right? So um, uh, I, think, I think that is, that is definitely a, a challenge that, that we need to uh, tackle here. Um, right, in terms of impact of, uh, uh, of business agility on uh, uh, COVID-19 responsiveness, um, and this is the link to the successes, uh, uh, right? And the successes that uh, um, that are reported by our participants. In fact, the organizations, also as Martin said, that invested in business agility earlier, that invested in these adaptable structures, they benefit from it, right? Because they have the internal technology, they have better internal networks, right? And they can reorganize themselves in a better way. Right. We can see this coming back within the internal organization, but also in the end, uh, uh, how these organizations approach the client, approach the markets. Uh, so from, from that perspective, three takeaways from my side. Uh, uh, so on one hand, COVID uh, uh, has, has an impact on the perceived successes. Um, uh, we see uh, uh, still sort of the challenges. Uh, so I think the, 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 our homework to be done uh, is, is very much consistent over the past year. So that's, that's, that, that these are the challenges we need to, we need to tackle. And, and perhaps the last one is uh, there is still much more awareness uh, needed, right? When we look into some of, some of the responses, uh, they've still very much uh, are centered around what we call delivery agility. Right, uh, and this is obviously natural, right? Because agility grow from a team perspective towards a tactical program level perspective, and now we're connecting into portfolio and and and, and our business drive, right? Um, but uh, there is more enablement and education uh, to be done, I think, for for this to be understood. So, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, giving back to uh, to Evan. All right, thank you. Uh, so, so let me just sort of wrap this up. Um, before I get to the diseased elephant in the room that is COVID, let's actually just talk about business agility uh, more broadly. So, as we've seen in the report and in the report for the last couple of years, um, global business agility and and let's be clear about the 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 selection bias that does exist in this report because those who take the survey are on the journey right this is not surveying organizations just on the street right so there is a, a known selection bias um, in the data but taking that into account we know that for companies on the journey there is a fairly broad spread from low to high maturity. What we do see is certain key trends. Um, business agility maturity on average is pretty much straight down the middle. Um, it's gone up from last year by, I think it was like eight or 9%. I don't have this, my computer is crashing, so I don't have anything open but Zoom. Um, but it went up from 4.4 to 4.8 um, out of 10 um, in, the last, uh, in the last 12 months. And especially there's a huge spike post COVID and I'll talk to that in a second. Um, this year sees a larger increase in the number of highly mature organizations. That is organizations uh, who are running and flying using the nomenclature from agility health. Um, and that's 25% from up from 21% from last year. Now, interestingly, uh, this is actually the first year that we had any responses from large, like over 10,000 employee companies who scored over seven. In the previous two years, um, uh, no large organization has rated themselves as, as highly mature. Some other interesting findings. Um, manufacturing. 
has emerged in the top three industries for business agility, which is, um, uh, it bears out based on some of the case studies and the references that we are starting to see from the industry, but it is somewhat surprising. Um, financial services has dropped to either number four or number five, um, uh, and uh, consulting firms and technology firms remain at number one and number two, and that hasn't changed in the last three years. We've had an increase, a 9% increase in business agility for large organizations, not just the one <laughs> who scored seven and above, um, but just in general, uh, large organizations have uh, invested greater in business agility. Now, COVID-19 is a factor, as in it has increased um, post-March, um, but it is not the only factor as it was increasing pre-March as well. Touching on COVID-19. Um, so a couple of interesting stats. So first of all, um, as Martin mentioned, you probably can't read that. We set uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, the median of all lockdown dates around the world. Um, uh, 23rd of March is kind of in that middle range. Um, now, uh, there is a, a small point. We did exclude China from this, partly because they locked down way before everyone else. So that's an outlier. But also we have very few respondents from um, the greater China region in our data set. I think three in total. Um, so we had 192 responses pre-COVID, uh, or COVID lockdown, I should say and 241 respondents post COVID lockdown, which gives us a pretty decent even split before and after, which is good for comparative purposes. So what we did see um, post COVID, North America went down in uh, average maturity by 10%, whereas the rest of the world went up by 15%. Um, for those of you uh, who received the correction email, this was a small mistake. Uh, on uh, in the body of the report, we had the numbers correct, but in the key findings, probably the worst part <laughs> to to make a mistake in transcription, um, we'd uh, had the wrong data point. We'd put twenty five percent down for North America, not ten percent. So, um, uh, if your report says twenty five percent on page five, please re-download it um, because that is incorrect. Um, uh, what else? So. Uh, as Martin mentioned, some of the uh, s some of the impacts or, or some of the drivers for that increase comes from customer centricity, right? Being more customer centric, the n amount of time they've been on the journey, and whether HR is involved in the transformation. HR was a huge driver for increasing business agility post COVID, uh, which I think. Uh, uh, we'll hopefully have some experience in seeing why that might be the case. Um, the last thing I really want to touch on, actually the last two things. So the top three domains um, uh, and the domains of business agility, if you're unfamiliar, is a model of the characteristics of an agile organization. The top three domains that emerged as drivers for business agility was customer at the heart, so customer centricity or customer obsession. Number two, strategic agility, which makes a lot of sense given the importance of sort of an emergent or an adaptive strategy post COVID. And the board of directors, which um, in some ways goes to Laura's question um, in that we know organizations that are, uh, that are driving their transformation from the top, whether it is the C-suite or the board of directors have much greater agility outcomes than those who are driving their transformation from anywhere else inside the organization. The last is less so a data observation and more just a personal observation. Um, for those of you who um, have been with us for a while, you'll know that we had our business agility conference in New York in the middle of March, uh, literally three hours after our conference opened, I had to come on stage with Ahmed, my co-founder, and sort of report that the World Health Organization had declared a pandemic, which was an interesting experience to say the least. But what was interesting to, is to see that there were, how companies were responding or reacting. Uh, and I use those two words very carefully because 
think of business agility as almost going to the gym. Right? You have to practice, you train, you build that muscle memory. And as you build that muscle memory, certain uh, behaviors become easier. They become ingrained. So those organizations that had sort of a business agility muscle memory, they were the ones who were able to respond. They were the ones who knew how to make strategic decisions with insufficient information in a changing environment. And while COVID-19 was an order of magnitude greater than any, any other uh, situation they'd probably dealt with before, that experience, that muscle memory helped them. Whereas those organizations that hadn't been to the business agility or the agile gym were reacting. They still had to make decisions every, every day because that's what you do in crisis. Right? But their decisions in many ways were disconnected and, and uh, did not lead to the same outcomes. And we see that both in our data and we see that more generally. So uh, I want to, before we hand over to the uh, Q&A, and we have some great questions in the chat, uh, which I'll take on. Um, I just want to put in sort of four very quick calls to actions. Um, and I ran out of space on my board, so I, I wrote these up. So number one, right, become a member of the Institute. Right? The usual pitch, right? we live on membership, so that would be helpful. But the next three calls to actions are about our research. We have currently, uh, well, actually we have eight research projects, but there are three that you can help with. Um, one is we are doing a study on the business impact of COVID-19 to the agile community. So if you are in an agile role, whether it's a scrum master or a coach or a transformation lead, um, please, it takes five minutes, share your insights and the impact that you have seen for you personally, whether you are in work or out of work. We need both. Number two, we are working on a piece of research on meeting culture. Again, it's a five minute survey. It'll ask you to open your calendar to the last meeting that you had. And it'll ask you things like, did you multitask? Um, which yes, I know you all do, so it's okay. Um, but please be honest and share. And uh, lastly, um, take the 2021 Business Agility Report survey. Right? That as Martin said, that is open. Um, and uh, we need as many respondents now, right? rather uh, uh, so that we can do a during COVID and hopefully let's assume COVID is in the rearview mirror by this time next year, um, we can do a during and post COVID analysis. All right, so uh, Evan, we I are, mm, sorry, Sally, yes. I will, do, I will take questions for you to give you a break. How about that? I'll read some of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic. Unless you had any other final comments before I, I nope, go in. No, nope, I was done. Okay, perfect. So we have a question here from George. Um, I took a glance at the report. First of all, awesome work team. Congratulations, keep up the good job. I don't see any references to the role of technology in business agility. Any reason for this? Who'd like to answer that? I'll give it a quick stab. Um, I think it's because the first thing you're looking at is a people process culture, if you want to put it that way, right? Um, tools are fantastic, technology is fantastic, but it's a support to the overall way your company or your organization operates. So if you have uh, an evil machine, then the tools might not get the outcomes that you want. Work with the people first. I'll also say that in the data, we see that technology um, Organizations that transform just their technology function have worse outcomes than organizations that transform, well, other divisions as well, right? not, not instead of, but as well. Um, finance, it, it's a small um, uh, uh, increase, but finance does seem to be the division with actually the biggest um, uh, overall impact. So, so a lot of the, the societal and technology, uh, technological trends, they fuel business agility and they, they can support it, right? But we see what's happening with the challenges that are re re reappearing in the reports, right? If we don't have the right structures, if we don't have the right mindset and the right steering of this, technology is not going to help us. That's it. Wonderful. Any other answers? Otherwise, I will move to the next one. I think this is one, this one's good for Steve. Steve, um, Rod says, 
what has been the most successful adoption strategy for business agility? Has it been top down, bottom up, or meet in the middle? How would you respond to that? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you do find cases uh, of all of the above, but um, uh, I would say uh, bottom up, which is endorsed by the top, is probably the most uh, successful strategy that I've seen, the most widely successful. And um, this is sort of the Microsoft case where it starts out uh, one team, three teams, 25 teams, 300 teams, and then the whole company. Um, it's embraced by the, the CEO after that had been underway for, for eight years and it was living a, a kind of a, uh, a secret life almost uh, for those eight years, but then eventually the head of the secret life became the CEO. And so it became the whole organization. Uh, and um, there, ha there have been cases of top down. Um, and Amazon, you would probably say is a case where Jeff Bezos led it, uh, SRI, it was led from the top. Um, but in general, the top down um, uh, efforts get tangled up into uh, all of the problems of um, uh, this is seen as an imposition that's not to do with the mindset it's some new gadget it's some new process and it's not real and before you know it the whole thing is uh, unraveling and the firm is backtracking and going back into the old mode so it can be done top down um, uh, typically someone in the middle or upper middle, lower middle says, I need to make a change. I'm going to start the movement. And they start and they win supporters, admirers, and eventually uh, in some cases have taken over the whole organization. But obviously there are many accidents and disasters <laughs> where they are stopped and blocked. And, um, and we can go into why that happens. Um, but that's my take on the overall perspective, but I'm sure Sally and Martin and Chris have, have um, additional views to add to that. I think well said. Does anybody want to add anything else to Steve? I will move on to the funding and profitability question. Um, Trent uh, Mason asked a question. Hi, Martin or all. I believe you mentioned funding as one of the key aspects or enablers of business agility. Do you have any further details into what this looks like? I have uh, an understanding of beyond budgeting, for example, but interested to know what and how um, organizations are actually implementing this. And a similar question to this, because you are, you're very quantitative uh, from Xavier is, do you already have, have you already done any longitudinal correlation analysis between business agility and profitability? So the funding, uh, the funding models question is more, I think like if you make a massive change, uh, like the beyond budgeting side, that could be fantastic. But the more immediate question would probably be to look as to how does your finance and funding work with the rest of the organization. If it's on a completely separate cycle, if it speaks a different language, like the, the work and the way people are like individuals are paid and arranged uh, is completely disconnected. That's probably the first challenge to start looking at you know, have conversations with the finance people in the same room, start to speak about similar units of measurement. And that's how you can start to look at, okay, am I lining up to outcomes? Uh, is everything globbing together as opposed to being funded in buckets that have nothing to do with the work of the people? That'd be the first step. Um, and then to Xavier's question on longitudinal. Um, so the, the, the challenge with the profitability question is it's a lagging indicator. So you need several years to start to see the benefits. Um, but also one of data. So um, for the, we, we need, in order to get an, sorry, Xavier's question to be repeated here was, can we see like a direct correlation between business agility and profitability? And in order to get that, you would need uh, a lot more public data about the responding companies like profitability or annual reports. We had had a look at this, um, but there's just not enough to say that it's statistically significant at this point in time. So more respondents would be fantastic, and we'd love to answer that in the future. Um, Steve, if I could direct that same question to you. So outside of the scope of the survey respondents, would you say that you have enough data to prove, as you had mentioned, companies like Amazon and Google and all of them that have invested in business agility have really thrived in the current market? Um, 
if we mm. looked at that question, both from the survey, but outside of the survey perspective. I mean, thrive is the understatement of the, the millennium. <laughs> <laughs> they are rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Um, um, and of course, that leads on to other uh, questions if, uh, as to whether this uh, division of financial resources is, is equitable. And when you have the richest people in the world owning the firms and some of the poorest people in the world working in the firms, then they are now facing a massive political backlash. If you saw in the US, the, the uh, hearings in the US Congress in July, there was bipartisan venom on the wealth and riches that these organizations had generated. And it came on multiple grounds, but uh, I think these firms obviously need to pay attention to uh, the equity of their financial arrangements. On the budget thing, let me just say, I've been interacting with the beyond budgeting people for 20 or for, for a couple of years. They've been at it for 20 years. And my take is that after 20 years, they have two firms which have gone beyond budgeting. And uh, so as a, as a case study uh, and how to solve the problem, um, I'm not sure that abandoning the budget is, is the right way. I think what happened, the, the budget is typically a massive debacle, a big problem, takes a year and is still going on even uh, after the, the um, budget cycle is closed. So, and it's basically a battle between silos. So if you're having, I came to the conclusion that if you're having battles, these kind of battles on the budget, it means you haven't become agile. You're still, you're still in a siloed organization. And so long as you have a siloed organization, you're going to have those big budgets. So if you can move onto a network uh, organization, uh, um, where you're focused on outcomes and it's not about which unit you're in, but which customer you're actually delivering value to. Then you see in the firms that have mastered this, I think like Microsoft and Amazon, the budget isn't a big debacle between silos because there are no silos. The budget is simply a reflection of decisions on strategy, customer focused strategy that have already been taken and you just implement the strategy and it's a, basically a non-event. The big struggle is on strategy. Which are the customers of the things that we could do to add value to customers? Which are the most valuable? You set those priorities and then you fund the top of those, top uh, group of those activities. I think it sounds so simple, Steve. We um, fully agree. Eh? And maybe th th what, we, what we can also see is that, that uh, it's in fact a um, uh, 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 it makes visible that the people deciding on these budgets don't as, act as a team, right? This portfolio team or whatever it is, they, they pursue individual goals rather than thinking of, uh, of this alliance strategy and, and being on board for the decisions that they take. This is what we see. They're not focused on the customer. Basically, they this fundamental principle that the whole purpose of the firm is to deliver value to the customer. And less than until you everyone in the whole firm is living and breathing that principle on a daily and hourly and minute by minute basis in everything that they do, then you're going to have massive problems in the budget and have massive problems all over the organization. And so that, that if you can't get that right, <laughs> nothing else is going to work properly. I do, I do remember one of the CFOs in, um, I think it was one of the Blue Crosses, once they shift their budgeting, they said they'd never go back again to the old budgeting. The shift is very scary, but once you go to it, the simplicity and just, it's so much more common sense. Um, so thank you for that. I want to go to Evan Leiborn and Xavier had the question of the market is still opportunistic and not really transcendent. That's kind of more of a comment and Evan, if you wanted to respond to that. But Melissa also had the question is, is there any kind of organization um, or industry that you think business agility doesn't work for? What about the size? Is there a size of a company that's too big or that's too small? if Evan and maybe even Christoph could jump into this. So, so I'll tackle sort of um, Xavier's question. So, so Xavier had a couple of questions and I think Tom, um, Tom Gill, hello, haven't spoken to you in ages. I hope you're doing well. Um, Roger, Kathy, there's a few questions just on, on business uh, outcomes and, and both the uh, implication of this is self-reported data as well as the fact that this is, um, uh, uh, 
does business agility lead to greater business outcomes? So let me answer in two ways uh, to sort of all these questions that we've lumped together. Um, first of all, from a data perspective, that is a really hard question to answer. Um, unless you are a publicly listed company, um, financial outcome-based data is really hard to get your hands on. There are data sources like Aula and Metamark, which do try and aggregate some of that, but it is in many ways based on hearsay and supposition um, uh, based on sort of uh, markets, uh, how they engage with the market. Now, uh, that's not to say that we haven't tried. Uh, so we have uh, been looking. One of the other challenges is the impact of multiple variables. So we know that large organizations, and we're talking 10,000 plus people, um, tend to score lower on, in fact, they pretty much do score the lowest in business agility compared to any other uh, size organizations, which is also the size of organization, which is generally publicly listed. So, so when, like, when you're doing like a multivariance, a nah, multivariance analysis, we are. It's, it's like a a a sketchy duh, a sketchy duh, a sketchy data set merged with self-reported data with a whole bunch of um, both sort of uh, forcing uh, forcing functions and, and complementary variables that sort of uh, blur the line. Now, so. That's from a purely research perspective. Um, I do want to answer this a little bit further, and then maybe Steve, I think, uh, and, and, and others may have an opinion here as well. But um, two things. So number one, there is a very small, even in the data, a very small correlation between the two. Right? It's not statistically significant, uh, which is why it's not in the report, but that small increase has been shown um, in the last three years. So while the number isn't statistically significant, the trend is certainly interesting. Uh, the other thing then goes to some of our other work where we are, rather than going through self-assessments, we are actually uh, going through and talking with um, a sort of <clears throat> externally assessing organizations. And because that's a, a much more like a close uh, analysis of this organization. We are asking for their financial data, obviously anonymized, uh, so that we can do these, uh, so we can do this analysis properly. And that's part of the, uh, the accreditation program that will be launching uh, later this year. Um, so we have baseline. So even though the data is self-reported, we have gone out and baselined it against uh, uh, expert assessed numbers as well. So, so we are being, we are able to, to not to normalize that and we are trying to, and we are seeing some trends there. Uh, and personally, anecdotally, uh, we are seeing organizations that are seeing quite significant market success. And if you look at, if you, if you look at the commentary, in the business agility report, um, market success and being able to sell more and being able to 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 uh, uh, provide better products to customers is a common benefit that is uh, attributed to business agility in the respondents from the survey. All right, that's a bit of a roundabout answer. Uh, I, I wish I could give you a, a definitive yes, absolutely. Business agility gives a seventeen percent increase, but. Um, in all openness and honesty, I cannot say that right now. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Let me say, there, there are no, or very few if any, uh, with and without cases, uh, agility without agility. So, that is also true. Um, so we're going to be looking at case studies, not at, um, not at scientific evidence. And, and we need to be clear that companies like Amazon when they say they're agile, we're only talking about the top 15%, not about the rest of the organization. And we can argue about whether that's right or wrong, but um, they certainly get a lot of value out of the top 15%. I, and do now have very large organizations. I mean, 15% of agile is still like 70,000 people and Microsoft is over 100,000 people. So these are not, these are not small organizations. So they, 
the argument that this doesn't work in large organizations is, um, um, I think it's, it's a very hard argument to make, but it's based on cases and we can look at other cases and uh, um, we see other large organizations that, that, that haven't made that, uh, but I don't think it's size, which is the issue. And in general, you look into those and you find that there are, it's mindset, it's uh, principles that they're operating under, it's the assumptions that is driving the top management that then flows down throughout the organization and undermines or yeah, strengthens process. All of those things determine how the organization functions. Um, we'll take one more question if Christoph can answer this with me. Um, there's two questions that are very related, Christoph, and they're about management and leadership, right? And so this is something that you had passionately talked about. One of them is for me and it's more around um, as a scrum master, this is from Joan, uh, Johan Zeely. Uh, how do you get, uh, as a scrum master, how do you convince management uh, that want to measure the wrong things and should focus more on the metrics that I had uh, talked about? Uh, so my comment to you, Joan, is really, it's, it starts with education. I think that managers are just measuring what they have in front of them. What they have in front of them are tools that measure output, right? And they, and they see all sorts of reports and velocity and all these different things. And so they feel like, well, you know, now I'm using agile metrics. And so let me start using using these metrics. Um, I think just allowing them to pause, sharing a, a, a webinar with them, a, a video, a recording that explains to them why you have to measure three different things, maturity, behaviors, and practices of the teams, um, which lead to performance metrics, which lead to outcome metrics. I really think it's a lack of education, similar to how leaders and managers don't even understand agile very well, um, let alone business agility. I think that they're just grabbing onto the metrics that they have um, at their disposal, not realizing the connection between those three metrics together. Um, I want to go to Christophe now, and um, Larry said, this uh, complex knowledge work is fundamentally different and has been known for decades. Why do you think management, and I'm not saying leadership, he said, seems to still doesn't understand about these things, that just you have to lead in a different way. Um, on, from everything in the report, this has been our number one challenge. So I'll leave the floor to you, Christophe, and then we'll let Evan close us off. One minute Thanks. only. A great question, right? So um, uh, uh, there was one word that is very important in the discussion, and that is trust. Trust between uh, leaders, managers, and, and, the, and, the, and the people that, that work together in these organizations. And, and some of this, this, this is caused in the fact that a lot of our management is related to management of individuals rather than managing teams and organizations, right? And based on that, we, we, we base a lot of the metrics in our organizations up to utilization on individual sort of metrics rather, rather than measuring teams. Um, Right, and 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 um, and that leads to the fact that managers want to see details of utilization of every single member in in the organization, right? Uh, um, which leads sort of to which creates sort of more discussions, and 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 in order to um, and it's based also on the fact that uh, let's see on a on a on a on a scale of leadership, right? Uh, from from more directive leadership styles and this individual leadership styles towards towards what we call um, empowering uh, uh, servant leadership and and uh, and and these type of uh, 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 enabling leadership styles. Um, uh, many people uh, uh, have difficulties uh, uh, to, to find the right balance, right? Uh, because successful leaders are in fact able to identify the situation and uh, are able to use the right skill and the right style in context, right? But the point is because of the background of so many of us and the experiences that, that, that people build are on, on individuals, right? They have difficulties to build, build environments towards, uh, uh, towards uh, these type of shared leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, uh, um, uh, building trust, and this needs to go both ways, right? So on one hand, leaders and managers of organizations need to trust their teams and need to enable them for education, giving them the right skills. But at the same time, also the, 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 the individual team members, they need to make sure that, that this trust is being built on a manager's side, right? Because otherwise, it's going to go into more matrix, more meter and detailed matrix, and, and, and we know we can spend and we can keep our teams busy and our organizations busy for months and months 
months producing data, producing dashboards without a leadership being uh, being trustful towards those, right? So, um, so in that sense, leadership is a function that is not only you know management, higher management should have, but every individual within within our organization, within teams, uh, we should definitely invest more in in the education and the implement of that, uh, and in building trust. Uh, we're a little bit out of time. Thank you. This was that was amazing. I love how you emphasize trust. We'll give it back to you, Evan, to close us off. All right, I'll just be very quick. All right, so thank you everyone for for uh, jo for joining us with this launch. Um, it's it was definitely an exciting time putting together all the data and putting together the report. We haven't had a chance to answer all your questions, and there was a lot there and some really good questions. So please feel free um, uh, reach out to 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 us or any of us directly here on the panel. Um, ask your questions over LinkedIn, email, however you want to like carry a pigeon, whatever works. Um, and we'll certainly um, answer whatever questions that you, that you may have. Um, please, if you can uh, help us with our research, help us with some of the other material uh, and some of the other work that we're doing. Um, check out the Business Digital Library with um, hundreds and hundreds of case studies and references covering a lot of the topics that you have in your questions around HR and finance, marketing, as well as different industries. Um, and uh, uh, if there's anything that, uh, if you have anything to share, uh, either like insights or data, come and have a chat with me and let's find a way of uh, getting your, your insights um, uh, published as well. On that, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sally, and thank you for taking over the, the, the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Christoph and Martin, for the amazing analysis work um, that, the, that you and your organizations have done. And Steve, as always, your insights uh, always, always amplify any conversation. So I really appreciate you joining us for this hour. On that, everyone have a wonderful day.